Washington got two big commitments over the last couple days. You are Locked On Huskies, your daily podcast on the Washington Huskies. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back into another edition of the Lockdown Huskies podcast. I'm Roman Tomashoff. That's Lars Hansen. We write for Inside the Huskies of Fan Nation Sports Illustrated. You can check out all our written work over there at si.com slash college slash Washington. Thank you for making this your first watch or first listen of the day. Today's episode is brought to you by Fan. We'll make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 if your team wins. Visit fanduel.com slash locked on to get started all right lars so let's start with the the big one in terms of the rankings you were down there in tacoma for a five-star point guard zoom diallo's commitment to the washington basketball team just i i, I know you got to talk to him and everything so i'm just i'm just going to give you the floor here because this is massive yeah and i mean we had kind of hinted at it a couple of months ago that washington was starting to gain momentum right but when you looked at the bigger picture you're like okay he's, he's down to four right arizona gonzaga usc and washington of those four there's two safe bets, Arizona and, George, and uh, Gonzaga, right? So right. it would have been surprising if you went to USC and they kind of fell off towards the end, which, uh, you know, understandable, right? And especially, you know, he so he's from Tacoma, went to Curtis High School, transferred to Prolific Prep in Northern California for a senior season. But he came back. So originally, he's kind of just peeling back here. So originally he was going to make his decision on his birthday, which I believe was in mid-November, mid to late November. And at, believe it, had he committed at that point, it wouldn't have been Washington. Because what he, what it sounded like from what he told me was that Washington really had kind of continued to come on. And that was right around the time when you're starting to beat Gonzaga. You know, you're, I don't believe they had played Gonzaga yet. At least if I, off no, not yet. Not in mid-November. That was like early December, yeah. Right. So 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 what they started to continue to gain momentum. And I had kind of heard things you know, like, hey, like Washington's still there. Washington's still there. And I'm like, okay, but like being still there and like one of the favorites is still there's a gap that you got to close there right and, and it sounded like i want to say less than a week ago like you know about three or four days before he made his decision is when he actually t- decided that it was going to be washington so it, it took a lot for him to get to that point but i think the fact that he made the commitment you know he could have if he wasn't sure of it or didn't want to he could have just kept it open because Recruits can't sign until April. So it's not like he needed to make this decision in public and all that. But I do think it's kind of a good sign for Washington, right? Because you're getting a five-star point guard, one of the top 20 players, top 50 players in the country. This is different than getting, you know, a nice four-star piece, right? A nice, a couple of nice, sure. you know, like Casper Chavis, who's still a really nice piece to have, but getting Zoom is just like kind of an over-the-top piece where, you know, we'll see what the team is going to look like next year, but now just kind of no matter what it looks like, the guard depth is there. Exactly, and you have to also imagine that with Wesley Yates being, you know still a ways down from his injury and coming back next year, then you have three guards, right? You have potentially even four, right? Corin, Kashmir, Diallo, and um, Nate Calmes would still be somebody that you'd consider right, and, 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 and right, exactly. And so there's plenty of guard play. So then the rest of it just goes to the portal, right? And I think the way yeah. that you know, kind of speaking to the college football side of things and now college basketball side of things, it's easier to get guards out of high school and then get the bigs out of the portal, right? And, you know, if you're a wash, right, you think about it like, hey, you can you want to kind of develop offensive linemen right get two three years from the yep. program but then you can get the receiver the cornerback the d lineman you know that one year guy the plug and play guy and i mean if you look at the roster that's basically the same way it's built so they only were going to target two players out of high school and they got both of them so i think right. it's a massive statement for hopkins will conroy was the first coach that diallo called to let him know he actually i obviously put the tweet out there that uh, Diallo didn't tell Hopkins, Mike Hopkins, he was committing until after he made his decision. And Zoom said, "Well, because I knew Hopkins was gonna like you know jump out of the chair, I knew he was gonna like you know jump up, you know go do some parkour and jump off a build, you know not not, not jump off a building, I right? you know just kind of just go crazy and happiness. So I wanted to kind of like you know let him you know let him find out and then and then tell him. Um, but I so it was for everyone saying it was an NIL situation. I never once heard those words and it didn't strike me as that being that type of situation, because again, if it was an NIL situation, he would have gone to Arizona. 
Like I'm pretty sure. confident in saying that, like, especially when it comes to basketball right now, this is football, a different discussion, but this is a massive commitment for Washington. And it now sets the program up perfectly to where you have plenty of guard play next year. Now you just got to add the bigs, which they were already going to do in the portal anyways. Right. And then just, just to kind of take that a step further, um, we just zoom is just such a fantastic player and, the local recruiting aspect of this needs to be highlighted for one reason or another, right? Where you and I don't necessarily agree that you always need to just hammer taking all the in-state kids for, for one reason or another. Uh, but it's still an important piece to have when you're adding the right pieces from the state of Washington. And obviously when you look at a kid like zoom, yeah, this is, this is the right piece to add. Probably he can, he can be a starter next year and just, everything that he's going to bring to this team on the court and, and off the court as well. And do you think this is something that just, just kind of, you know, it's as, as much as we, as we know, this is big, we kind of have to primarily focus on football with all this. Is this something that you can see potentially having an impact in the 2025 class in terms of uh, the football recruiting as well? Um, Like from an in-state perspective, or just from like, yeah, just like, well, Hey, top basketball player committed, but might, might as well, you know, consider well, looking at Washington. Well, so it, it's worth remembering. He doesn't count as an in-state kid only because he's currently residing in California. That's fair. Uh, That's with fair. prolific prep. But, but to, to your point, I think it matters more that, okay. Cause I, I, the irony of what we, what, the 24 to 40 that hour period where Washington football misses out on Aaron Butler, which is probably like one of the safest, like, Hey, Jamarcus Shepard's recruiting this guy. Like there's no way right. he doesn't get him. Well, and then as we said, it's not maybe something Washington didn't do. It's just something else that Texas did do, right? And so sure. it's not for a lack of Washington. It's just other programs doing this. But then you see the basketball program at a five stars. Wait a minute. DeBoer can't get five stars, but Mike Hopkins can. It's like, well, again, you kind of have to – there's a little bit of a caveat there, right? Sometimes basketball players – Yeah, I mean, the last time Mike Hopkins got a five star was 2019, right? But when he got Isaiah Stewart and Jaden Daniels. So right. it's not like – Hopkins has been recruiting at this elite clip level. You know, he's gotten a good piece, a couple of good pieces, right? Corin Johnson, uh, Wesley Ace the third. You know, th- th- there's a number of guys that he's gotten that have been good pieces, but it's still taken a little time for them to develop and things like that. So I do think it could it does obviously help, I think to your to your answer your question, it does help the optics of saying, hey, we can get a five star to go to Washington, right? That's not sure, you know, either. Well, because the ironic part about Jaden McDaniels is he was the last in-state five-star out of the state, right? And that one came down to Washington and Kentucky. And that came down to the very, very, I mean, made almost like a JTT situation where it's like, hey, I'm just going to show up on campus. And if I pick Washington, I'll pick Washington. You know, it's like, hey, I'm just going to show up, right? I had had to do a public records request to get his NLI released back in, I want to say, what, like, end of april mid-april end of april like, i think it was like june at that point it was it was really really late and, and, right and so as i just remember i just remember that i, f- I filed the records request at like 10 30 the night before and then if there's a 24-hour legally obligated r- response um from all public institutions so then it happens like 11 30 10 30 the next night He's like sorry for the wait i'm just like hate to do it to you but like I mean, we kind of got to have these decisions and so like right. i think it does but it also does speak to the importance of will conway right because and, you know people Absolutely. say oh hey does this save hopkins job well you know i think you asked me and a few other people asked me well hey i would be kind of surprised if conroy doesn't at least get his shot with the program if hopkins doesn't work out or like hey we'll save some of the money from hop we'll give a little bit more of a pro- we'll give a little bit more in the salary pool for conroy but, you know, we'll at least give you the keys for a couple of years and see what you can do with it, right? Because it seems like it's not that he didn't commit to Hopkins, right? But it's like, hey, like, obviously Conroy was the lead recruiter. Con- Conroy is kind of the plug of all this. So it's an interesting dynamic. And Hopkins knows that. So it's not yeah. like he's blind to it. It's not like Hopkins is, oh, hey, I'm this great recruiter. I'm this and that. But at the same point, it's an, it's an interesting di- – it's almost like Kalen, right, where – Jamarcus Shepard is recruiting the receiver, but I also want to play for Coach DeBoer too. Like I would run through a wall for Coach DeBoer, but I also love Jamarcus Shepard, right? So it's it's again not for a lack of one or the other. It's a good combination. So it should it should help Washington moving forward in the twenty five class. No, and 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 that's no. I, I'm glad I'm glad you answered it the way that you did because it can all play off each other, right? Where the these two things can definitely have an impact on one another and. 
So I, I feel like that's a good place to just kind of move over because we're going to move from the, the basketball side of things to the football side of things because uh, Kalen DeBoer staff also got a Christmas Eve commitment. But before we get there, we got to give a shout out to our good friends over at FanDuel. As the weather gets colder, the NFL offers stay hot on FanDuel. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's 150 bucks if your team wins. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action. The app is so easy to use. There's a wide range of betting options, including spreads, player props, over-unders, and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season. FanDuel is an official partner of the NFL. And just a reminder to all you everydayers out there, Washington still four and a half point underdogs in the Sugar Bowl. And if you want to slam that line while you're down in Louisiana, I, th- I think we, we would both uh, say that only good things can come from that. All right, Lars, let's talk about Fresno State tight end Trey Watson, because I feel like some people might think of this as a little bit of an under the radar commitment in terms of his impact and just being at Fresno State, where it's not like, you know, getting BJ Green or getting Drew as a party, where Drew as a party, yeah, he's playing in the same conference at San Diego State, but it, he was just more of a well known figure where Trey Watson, Six foot five, 245 pound tight end. Looks like just an absolute mauler in the run game and can be just, I don't like, uh, you, you know, you know me from some of the conversations we had. I'm really high on the impact that Josh Cuevas can bring to this team. I think that Josh Cuevas can be just a true number one tight end target where not, not necessarily that he's going to be like, you know, Kate Otten in terms of his impact, but he can just kind of take that that heavy share of targets and turn them into something really good where Trey Watson can kind of have a similar impact to Devin Cole. And I think this is a great number two add to this tight end room. Yeah. It's an intriguing one, right? Because I mean, you're looking at all the other tight ends that they had either recruited or brought in for visits. I mean, Holden hates, you know, like all these other big time targets and then you settle, no disrespect, but settle with Trey Watson it almost wonders to me about, okay, are you going to take a second tight end or do you view Decker as the first tight end? And now you're taking this guy as the second tight end. Cause if that's the case, I'm okay with it. Cause I think Decker does enough in all facets of the game and he's younger that you can kind of have him for longer. My only concern is going to be, well, now you don't have Westover or Culp next season. Col- Quentin Moore, I believe does have one more year of eligibility left. Yeah. He's, he's on his last year in 2024. But at the same point, I don't think, you know, aside from his awesome moment in the Pac-12 championship game, I'm not sure that he's like the reliable guy, like, or the, the guy that's just say, hey, you know, we'll give you 30 targets or 40 targets or whatever the case may be. But I'm also not sure Watson's that guy either. So my question is almost going to be, okay, well, if you're having such a check down heavy quarterback potentially starting in Will Rogers, who is the guy? Because I, I agree Josh Quavis is going to be a guy. I have no doubt Josh Quavis is going right. to be a guy. But as we saw this year, hey, you need that second and third and maybe even fourth tight end, right? Watson might be a good third tight end option, but now you still need two and four. So to me, I'm, I'm, I'm a little intrigued by it because, again, you, I don't want to pour rain on it, right? Because I think to your point, it's more of a good like run blocking third body. This isn't going to be a guy that's like, you know, Colby Parkinson going down the middle of the field, right. really stretching the field sort of thing. Not that he can't. But I just don't see – I see Cuevas filling that role more so to your point. But I'm curious if they're going to add one more tight end or if they're going to call it good here and then hope that Otten, Ryan Otten comes along and I feel like I'm missing a, a player in that room. Nope, you've got – it's 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 a very small room right now, which is why I, I think your question is fair about adding another tight end, but I also don't think it's going to happen. And I also somewhat disagree, and I think that – Watson can be a two in a sense where let's look at his numbers last year at Fresno State. 38 catches, 378 yards, and four touchdowns. That's good enough to fill that role. Where, yeah, it's a step up in competition level. But at the same point, with his frame, with his athleticism, in just one year of eligibility, let's say they also do a do go out and get Ben Urosek, where that'd be a fantastic get, right? You and I agree that would be an incredible add, but that's just going to create so much, just so much havoc, I think is the only real word to use at the position in 2025, where all of a sudden it's Quentin Moore's out of eligibility, Eurosic would be out of eligibility, and Trey Watson would be out of eligibility. So then all of a sudden you've got to bring in at least two guys, whether it be through high school 
through the transfer portal again. And you're also, you're almost creating too many problems. If you do that, where I can see them taking two tight ends in 2025 high school class. I think that's really possible, especially, you know, when we look at in-state guys like Noah Flores, who I think is super talented. I'm super high on him. Um, but I, I think that they're going to call it good with Trey Watson, where Quentin Moore is probably going to still be that, that third tight end role where he'll be the main blocker. And I think that he might have, I just, I just think that Trey Watson can have a bigger impact on the receiving side of things that than you might think. Well, so I, I, I agree, but I, again, at this, I could, it, it's kind of splitting hairs in a way because um, it is, yeah. You know, you're also you're trying to compare. Okay, what what is this guy doing at Fresno State, and then what can he do at Washington? Right. But again, you know, kind of going against your your narrative when you look at his PFF receiving grades and things like that. You know, yeah, he's top twenty, but. When you're when you're top twenty and you're filling in the bottom five of that, it's different than Josh Cuevas, where last sure. year, even at the FCS level, or I believe the FCS, but even if not, if lower lower division level, he was top five. So you could right. see it and you could understand it with Cuevas. Like, okay, hey, this is big, you know, big fish in a small pond. Hey, let's see if he comes up. But he also proved that he could do it. Watson being that kind of middle of the rung, you know, like upper tier but lower upper tier makes me wonder okay if him and Quentin Moore are kind of in the same role who you know it, it's interesting right but I guess it's not the worst position to be in and to your point originally if he can run block I think that that kind of solves some of those pass catching questions that I would have right it's like hey right if you don't if you're not a question in the blocking department okay that's fine because then they can worry about bringing Ryan Otten along in the pass catching department so I think I'm assuming that's kind of their the read from it because otherwise, I mean, Ryan's got to find a role at some point. Like that's right. Because again, if, if he decides to transfer after the 25 season or 24 season, then it's then to your point again. Hey, what are we doing at 25? Because we got nobody except for Decker to graph. So again, that's what the portal is for. That's what you know. Ideally, you want a little more staggered progression in that room. But I mean, Sheridan's done a good job, so I don't I don't question I don't question it in that regard. I just think. There's truly not a like aside from Quavis, there isn't truly a game breaker at tight end as it was when you had Devin and West over the season. So you're right, and I, I I hear where you're coming from there because I I I and I feel like that was that was one of my my bigger points was I want to make sure that Nick Sheridan gets his props because he's doing a really good job, and that's one of the positions where we've seen what they've done with Jack Westover and Devin Cole, right? They've they've helped those guys come quite a ways along from where they were two years ago, so. I think that that's something that they can do where if he's identifying someone, it might not be on the same level of Ben Yurisic, right? Where we would, we'd expect that a guy like that can get 50 targets at, at the very least, given 50, 60 targets over the middle. And that's going to be a huge impact for you where no Trey Watson isn't that guy, but he can still be a very serviceable piece of this offense at the bare minimum. And he's somebody where, yeah, Oh, it's like, it's, it's going to be, oh yeah, oh, there's Trey Watson just picking up another first down. Like, look at Devin Cole from the Pac-12 championship game where he's just sitting there on the sidelines for a check down to Michael Penix, where that's absolutely, I could see him like just filling a role 25, 30 times over the course of the season and just doing more than enough. But I feel like one part of this conversation that we have to have um, in terms of them seeming, seeming to prioritize Trey Watson is there's still one open spot for a pass catcher. And I feel like you and I agree that the top target is going to be Cal transfer wide receiver, uh, Jeremiah Hunter, where he's going to be a guy where, yeah, he's only going to have one year of eligibility, but can be a huge impact. And I feel like this just helps open the door to make that happen. And no disrespect to Ben Urasek, but if I'm deciding between those two guys, I'm going to take what Jeremiah Hunter gives me 10 times out of 10. That, and that's fair. And I think if you're looking at it with that in mind and then thinking, okay, well, Watson can also be a better pass blocker and that'll kind of solve that, then I can kind of see that making more sense, right? Where, okay, we'll give Hunter the catches or more of the like 80% of the catches and we'll give Hunter the blocking that we right. would have gotten from a second tight end. So I think, yeah. And also the fact that Ben Yurosik was hurt last season, I could see maybe that holding some teams up, including Washington. So, you know, it's... As long as they get Jeremiah, if they get, if they get Jeremiah Hunter, then I think that solves a lot more questions because otherwise you're looking at it thinking, ooh, like you're going into next season with Jeremy Bernard, Den, uh, Denzel Boston, Giles Jackson, 
and uh, Josh Cuevas as your top four pass catchers. Right, and we think there's a lot of talent there, but it's right. just a it's it's just a matter of all right, they're still a little bit unproven at this level. Yeah. So you're you know you're you're right. It's a very fair question. Where I just I wanted to bring that up because the door is open for that, especially with and we talked about it the other day with the the Aaron Butler discussion, where that door is open. And now it's just a matter of, all right, can they find a way to seal the deal and make that happen? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I would be surprised. I think kind of it'll, it'll work out for them, right? That Hunter fell into their lap because obviously the target was Butler. But I think yep. almost it's almost better that they got a veteran because I think we kind of rant, we're saying that, you know, hey, you have so many young receivers at that position, you know, Reynolds, Williams, with those two receivers coming in this year, you know, there's, even Denzel Boston, right? You're kind of a younger-ish guy, right? So there's sure. there's enough young players, and they'll get a one year fr- one year transfer in there, kind of just fill that Roma Junte, Jim Paul, McMillan void, and keep it moving. Right, Lars, are you ready to talk about the Sugar Bowl? Because we haven't we haven't done that nearly as much as we should just yet. So we're gonna we're definitely gonna make sure we spend the 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 entire rest of the week doing that. So Lars, let's talk about the biggest advantage that Washington can have in this game, because we've seen Texas fans on Twitter saying, oh, well, Texas's interior defensive line is just going to overwhelm Parker Brailsford, which is something you and I disagree with. We've talked about that on the show, but let's, let's look at that from a Washington perspective, because this is a Washington podcast, despite what, especially Oregon fans might think when they were in our comments saying we expected, um, you know, just like just straight down the middle analysis of this game, which is what we absolutely try to bring you here on Lockdown Huskies. But it's also called Lockdown Huskies. So we're going to look at everything from a Washington angle of things. So what do you think is Washington's biggest advantage over Texas in this game? Uh, easily it's Washington receiver trio of receivers versus Texas's swishy secondary. Like that, that, so that to me, and I got my, it's, it's almost, you can almost make the same argument for Texas, but again, if you look at Washington's receivers, they're, the edge is that receiver, right? Like, you know, yeah. it, it, okay, toss up offensive line if you want to just call it that, even though Washington's allowed half as many sacks as Texas. But we'll get there. Kinda, I've, I've got some thoughts there. That's, where, that's but, where I'm coming from here today. But really, to me, everything comes down to the receivers, right? Because as long as the offensive line can hold up just a little bit, right? Texas is secondary is a, is a, it, it, there are so, a lot of questions. Let's say I was I was going to say I'm trying to phrase this you know, <laughs> nicely enough, but yeah, there's a big advantage to be had if you can hold up for about two and a half seconds, right? Which is absolutely this 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 offensive line. Who oh hey they won the Joe Moore Award can do, and outside of that, it just Washington fans have seen Pete Kwiatkowski for a very long time. They know what he likes to do. They know what he likes to play, and. Not only that, I, and despite what you want to say about, you know, this being a different Texas team or this being a different Washington team, the scheme for the most part is not going to change very much because we saw that here for seven years. We, for seven seasons, we had to see Pete Kwiatkowski, and he's awesome. Not trying to say that in a negative light, but Washington fans know that really well. And I feel like one thing that, you know, is, is a discussion that needs to be had is Chris Peterson still works an advisory role for, for Washington. And do you think that Ryan Grubb is in his ear saying, hey, do you, do, you, do you think that there are any extra things that we might be able to do to take advantage of Kwiatkowski's defense? Because I know you and him worked together for a very, very, very long time. So how how can I exploit this? And I, I that's a discussion to be had. But of course, Washington's receivers are are second to none. We've seen that time in time and time again this season. So th- there's just so much to talk about in terms of Washington's receiving core just being as good as they are against this this Texas Texas secondary where you're right there there are a lot of questions there. Yeah, I mean I'm not sure Grove will need to call Chris Peterson about that. He doesn't just, need to, but why not? Is is well, more well, more my angle there? Well, I I I think I agree with what you're coming from, but I I just almost think like. Chris Peterson never even had for as good as Jonathan Smith was, Ryan Grubb is a different kind of different caliber of offensive coordinator, right? Where he just seems like a guy where he 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 will ask opinions, but he's a guy that truly doesn't need to, right? He'll sure. so I I could see him like, hey, you know, P, what what, what challenge is Kukowski? You know, this and that, this and that. But I think almost it's like, well, they they know the game plan from last season. 
it's not that much different this season, right? Like you'll, now you'll say, oh, wait, hey, Texas has different players, this and that, Quinn Ewers is better, yada, yada, yada. It's like, okay. But like, you can't point to, aside from maybe A.D. Mitchell, you know, where, like, hey, like there's another receiver that wasn't there last year, right? It's like then you point to Dylan Johnson. You know, so the tight like, end, too. Their, their tight end is really good. Right, but uh, it, to me, it, it comes down right. That's actually more of a dangerous threat for Washington, yeah. right? Because like yeah. that, that's that's where the money is going to be had for Texas is somehow um, Quinn Ewers hitting the check down for ten yards that goes for fifty and a touchdown. That's just you know <laughs> screams Washington's defense here. But but yeah, and so I, I think it'll it'll be. I mean, you, there's no question Grubb's going to have something schemed up and cooked up. I think it's a matter. It just this game. Uh, not to give it away, but it's you know, it's going to come down to again a handful of points here and there, and probably five points here or there. It's it's right. not going to be a blowout one way or the other. If it does, if it's a blowout, it'll probably be probably for Washington. But I, I still don't think Washington is going to get to that point because there's going to there's there's something about this team to where even if you get a ten point seventeen point lead, somehow it ends up being like a five point game or seven point game at the end. Sure, somehow. It's just that's just the way it's worked all season, and yeah, and we're used exactly. to this from seeing it. But I I, I want to talk about the defensive side of the ball because Washington's pass rush has fallen under a lot of scrutiny this year, and rightfully so to a certain extent. Right? They've got a fir- first round pick in Braylon Trice on the edge, and they've only been able to muster 19 sacks. I was writing something about it over on Inside the Huskies, and one thing that I found in some of the research I was doing is that not a single one of those sacks has come from a defensive tackle, which at this point in the season. It, it, it doesn't matter anymore, right? You kind of know what you're going to get there, but the question is, can you find a way to hit home on Texas offensive line? And the answer in a, a weaker defensive conference in the Big 12 has shown to be yes, where Quinn Ewers and just Texas, sorry, Texas quarterbacks, I know Malik Murphy played a couple games for them, uh, was sacked 26 times this season. So there are definitely opportunities to be had there, and the impact of Zach Durfee, we're we're still going to wait and see how many snaps he's actually going to play, but I'm really curious about lining him up on the interior in the role that we've seen Jacob Lane fill, where you and I both really like Jacob Lane. We really like what we've seen from him, but Zach Durfee is just a really talented athlete who's shown that he can do a lot of things. We saw him lining up in that same turbo package in the middle of the defense in fall camp. And now the question is, what kind of impact can he have in this game? And Washington's pass rush have as a whole, because if they can find a way to get some pressure on Quinn Ewers, I think this can be, the defense can do a lot of what they did against Oregon, where they're doing enough and getting stops, which is something where up until that point, we hadn't seen that in a while. Yeah, Chuck Morrow, the co-defense coordinator, said that Obviously, he'll get some snaps, but it, because he didn't play the entire, I mean, again, did play, but didn't play, right? Did, you know, they, sure. they saw him at times, they were repped him at times, but they didn't rep him probably as much as they would have it if he was able to be fully eligible. So I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if maybe there's a handful of packages, maybe like a third down package, you know, for Durfee, just sort of thing. Yeah. But again, that also means the defense has to get in position on first and second down to be in those packages, right? Like if it's third and two, you're not bringing Durfee in. If you're, if it's third and eight, you're bringing Durfee in. So it, it's, yep. it's a matter of the, as long as the defense does its job in the first two downs, then you can bring in Durfee, but they're not going to bring him in just to say, Hey, we finally got him some snaps, you know, as an F as a, as a, as a, you know, what to the, to the, um, NCAA. NCAA. Right. But, but it's, it's a matter of what can give us the best chance to win. Obviously Derpy's pressure will give us a chance to win, but really with the bodies we have already, they should get home first, but they're going to find a way to get him on the field now that they can. Right. It's just a matter of, I would be surprised if he plays over 10 snaps, but sure. also if you're four, if you have five pressures in the game and you played 10 snaps, I don't care. That's why that's good with me. Yeah. I mean, you're probably getting one or two sacks or maybe, you know, forcing it up. And if all those are on third down, think about that. Like then you're forcing Texas to get the ball back on third down. There's yeah. a lot of benefits that can come, even just for playing 10 steps. So no, you're you're right. And so there there were two reasons I want to talk about Zach Durfee. One, we know what Braylon Trice is going to give this defense. We've seen it for years now. The question is the, the, the biggest question when you talk about it is just it's who else is going to step up? Will it be Zion Tupola Fatui? Will it be Void Tanufi? Just who is going to be the other pass rusher that can help take it 
just take advantage in some of these opportunities. There are a lot of guys that can do that. And Zach Durfee just always kind of seemed like the guy at the highest ceiling. But I think that Voight Tanufi could have a really big impact on this game because he's somebody who we've seen get pressure no matter where he gets lined up, no matter what he's just being asked to do. He always finds a way to get after the quarterback. And he's one of the guys that I'm looking at in this game that could just be a real X factor for this team. Exactly. I think that that because that's what this game is going to come down to, right? It's a handful of guys making a handful of plays. It's not just, oh, hey, Penix throws for 400. It's easily Washington. If Ewers throws for three or four touchdowns, it's easily Texas. It's like, no, all of those things are going to happen. Right. It's who is the one or two player on defense on both sides of the ball that are going to make a play in the fourth quarter when it absolutely matters. Like, that's who is going to be the Dom Hampton making a pick? Who's going to be the Jabbar Muhammad? Who's going to be the Derpy or Brandon Trice? Now, there's there's a number of guys to where all you got to do is make a play. All you got to do is make one play. One play wins the game. We're in the national championship. That's all you got to do. Really, and that's, what, and that's what we've seen them do all season, right? Yeah. Where just week in and week out, it's, oh, well, they needed to step up and make a play here. They did that. And it doesn't really like you can throw all of that out the window at this point, but there's a track record to be, to be talked about where it's okay. We've seen them do it here. We've seen them do it there. We're, we, th- we think they can do it again on, on this really big stage where it's, it's, it's going to be a fun battle. That's, that's, that's all we know. Right. I mean, that's the one thing we know. It's not going to be TCU, Georgia. That's all we that's, know. Yeah, that's and, the- and by the way, if I'm wrong about that, I would, I don't know which team I would love to see that for, but I, I even for Texas, I have a hard time seeing that. Like I, I have sure. a hard time seeing Washington just destroy Texas, right? Like forty-two sure. to ten, right? Like the most I could see would be like 34-24, right? Washington maybe wins by a touchdown and a half. You're like, okay, but this is not going to be a blow. It's almost going to be the perfect recipe for what the CFP wanted, which was an actual four-quarter game between two heavyweights, like. That's crazy true. it's like and and by the way like when you look at florida states half their roster is not even on the in college anymore so it's like okay well yeah, i guess you know yeah. two teams that wanted to show up showed up so here we are lars as always thank you so much for being here thank you to all the everyday for tuning in we really do appreciate your support we got so much more fun content coming to you for the sugar bowl so make sure you stay tuned for all that and make sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcast so that's youtube spotify app music amazon music we're there we are everywhere we're updating this channel every day with new content so please make sure you hit that subscribe button it really does help out our channel a lot make sure you like the video leave us a five-star review for your audio only that also really helps us out and leave a comment down below thank you so much for tuning in and we will talk to you on thursday